G'day, and welcome to a discussion about decoding 1935 Heineken Pilsner, Export Pilsner, Münchner, Münchner, and Bock from the Rotterdam Pilot Brewery Records. This collaboration all came about because I was following along on Dutch beers on Ron's blog, Shut Up About Barclay Perkins, and he mentioned that you could request records from the Amsterdam archive. So as you do, I had a look, use Google Translate, and selected and requested some records that looks as though they might have been interesting. After a few weeks, I was notified that the records were available online. The 1935 ones were from the Heineken Pilot Brewery in Rotterdam and had the full hot and cold side brewing details for a range of beers. I did some more searching and found relevant photos on the Heineken Foundation website covering this period. And with their kind permission, these have been used to illustrate our discussion. Uh, the slide you're looking at now, the unlabeled photograph looks like their 20 hectolitre plant. The other common theme was that a Mr. Middleton, a brewer from Tooth & Co, which is a Sydney brewery, had visited in 1936, and his trip report provided a lot of contemporary insights. And that came from the Noel Butlin Archive Center. So the beers we're going to look at today are Pilsner, Export Pilsner, Münchner, Bock, all pre-World War II. Now, a keen-eyed viewer might have noticed that both of our abbreviated bios include the word obsession, which is derived from the Latin obsessus, or besieged. And when you're obsessed, your mind has been besieged by uncontrollable thoughts of something. And that something in this case is beer. So here's what we're going to cover today. And now I'm going to hand over to that fountain of knowledge, Ron Pattinson, who will give us some history about the Rotterdam Brewery. OK, so here is Heineken's Brewery under construction. This was in uh, 1873 that they started to build it. You might wonder why, if you know something about the history of Heineken, they started building another brewery just a few years after they built their new brewery in Amsterdam. And one of the reasons seems to be that they wanted to have a purely bottom fermenting brewery. The, the new brewery in Amsterdam had been built before they completely committed to lager. And so it was not necessarily completely designed for the purposes of brewing lager beers, whereas the one in Rotterdam was. Um, and it seems to have been their most important brewery, because if you look at the, the numbers from the late 1800s, it was larger in size than the uh, Amsterdam plant. It was producing more beer, but significantly, it also had some of the really important parts of the brewery. So it had the laboratory, it had the yeast propagation lab, which was really important because Heineken were very big in export in selling excess yeast or selling yeast to lots of breweries, which is why Heineken yeast or descendants of Heineken yeast is in use all over uh, Europe because they were so active in selling it in the late 19th century. And they also had the pilot brewery there. And so this tells me that this was actually their main plant and not the Amsterdam one, which is what I'd always assumed. And it eventually closed in 1974, uh, which was a lot later than I expected. I thought it had closed either the late 50s or early 60s, but actually it was open until 1974, which explains why the last bit of new construction at the Amsterdam Brewery was a laboratory which was built in the 1970s, which I assume was built as a replacement when the Rotterdam Brewery closed. Here's a, a, a look at the brewery in the 1920s. Um, the body of water that you see at the front of it, that's the River Rotter, which 
it's not a particularly impressive river, to be honest. Um, and it's not very long. But I used to walk, I used to live in Crowsvike, which is the part of Rotterdam where the brewery is located. And I used to walk down the down the river, riverside. And the only bit of the brewery that were left in, at this point were the front of the brew house here. So those two nice bay windows, they were still there and just a little bit of the building behind it. And then the rest of it was a new office block. And this standalone building here, that's still there. All of the rest of the site's been cleared and it's all just social housing nowadays. Um, it was built in the late 70s, uh, early 1980s. And here's a quick look at the Heineken beers from the pre-war period. Um, there was also a stout there, but we're only looking at the lagers here. So that's why we haven't included that. And the stout was brewed in very small quantities. Very interesting, actually, but that's a completely different subject. And so you've got the Munchener, which is a dark lager of full strength, uh, a pills of full strength, the export pills, which is, I, I could hardly see any difference between the export pills and the standard pills. And this is another thing that the Rotterdam Brewery did. It brewed all the brewery for export. So the, uh, the brewery in Amsterdam, that served the north of Holland, the domestic market. And the uh, Rotterdam Brewery was the south of Holland and the export market, which is another indication of how important the brewery was. Um, you'll see at the bottom two, two beers that you might not have heard about. Typical from, from before World War II, Dutch breweries had a standard range of four or five lagers. So they'd normally have a Munchener and a Pill, so full strength, dark and light beers. And then they'd have a Dunker and Licht, so a dark and light lager beer. And that was a, something about three and a half percent, fairly cheap and cheerful beers, but which were quite popular. So, I mean, if you're looking at Amstel, I've got very good, a very good breakdown of where they were selling beers and how much they were selling everywhere. And something like 50% of the beer they sold in Amsterdam was draft Donker Lager beer, which I found is quite a surprise. And also at Heineken, the percentage of the lager beers is quite high. So whereas if I look in 1939 for the, um, uh, the Rotterdam brewery, just under 50% of the beer was Pils that they were brewing, but around 25% of it was the two lager beers combined. So fairly important products. And it, it seems to be this was the standard pub beer in some parts of, uh, of Holland. Big surprise to me. It's not what I'd expected it at all. Now here we, we're seeing one of the features of the of the big Dutch lager brewery seem to have been that they all produce their own malt. And at Heineken, it seems they seem to have produced pretty well all of it. Um, if, if you remember the, the picture of the, of the overhead view of the brewery, one of the big, next to the brew house, there's a very imposing looking building and that's the maltings. And they had both floor maltings and they also had other types of maltings, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, what this is saying here, this is from the, from the guy from Tooths saying about how they don't use Dutch barley. Now that was true in 1935, but it wasn't true for very much longer because what happened during World War I really, um, got to Dutch brewers because during World War One, even though Holland wasn't involved in the war, the disruption to, to trade caused by German U-boats meant that they couldn't import barley anymore. And they were seen to have been 100% dependent on imported barley. And so it had a devastating effect on the Dutch brewing industry. They basically almost had to completely stop brewing. So that, that, uh, by the end of the war, they're only brewing small quantities of very weak beer. And the shock that this gave them seems to have prompted them to start serious research in the interwar period, especially starting in the 1930s, to try and find varieties of barley, malting barley, that would grow well in the Dutch climate. And they seem to have just got this, just got their act together in time for World War II, because when you get to 1940, they're using almost exclusively Dutch grown barley for making malt out of. And it really saved them in the Second World War. They would have been totally screwed if they hadn't had their own barley, because that's what you see in Belgium, where they weren't growing very much barley. It's a complete disaster, World War II. Even by as early as 1941, they can hardly brew anything anymore because they've just simply run out of malt and they can't import barley from anywhere anymore. 
And here's the, the other type of modeling. So Saladin, which is a more modern and more mechanized uh, system. And so you can see that they were making various types of malt, so not just the lager malt. And we'll be getting on later. And, and, and thankfully, Peter will be talking about this, about the uh, one particular type of darker malt, which has um, had us scratching our heads for quite a while. And here's the, the mash tun, a very beautiful looking uh, uh, grant there. And uh, uh, as you can see, this is typical of brew houses that were put up in the late 19th century in that it's very ornate. You can see all the lovely um, stained glass windows and stuff. It's, it's very similar if you go to the, to the 1930s brew house that they still have in the Amsterdam brewery. If you go around there, it looks very much like this. It's really beautiful inside. And they obviously spent a lot of money. I mean, it's also uh, the, um, another brewery that's very like this is the um, Anheuser Busch plant in St. Louis, which is also a beautiful brewery. And here we're going to have a look at the grists. Uh, I was surprised at how many different types of malt uh, Heineken were using in, in their dark beers. So obviously you've got the base malt, which is going to be a, a Pilsner malt. Then you've got Clur malt, which is literally coloured malt, which is a type of something like black malt. So it's a very dark roasted malt. Brewy malt, which I'm, I'm going to thankfully leave Peter to explain because uh, it's, yeah had me scratching my head as I said. Then you've got caramel malt which is a sort of crystal malt and then you've got rice in some of the beers but uh, only in the in the pale beers though it does also turn up we haven't got it we're not looking at them in the detail here but it also turns up in the Donker and the Lift Lager beer. Um, and so you can see yeah mostly it's it's the base malt and, and then you've got this funny brewery malt which I'll, I'll, it took me ages to work it out because the handwriting and the records is really bad. And it really helped when I saw the pilot brewery records because the handwriting's better in there and they spelt things out better because they often abbreviate stuff in the, in the uh, records for the large brewery. And it can be a bit, bit confusing sometimes. Right. Um, Broy malt, is that the correct uh, pronunciation, Ron? Uh, brewery, yeah. Brewery, brewery. Brewery. Yeah. Um, this was very tricky. Um, so I looked online and I even found some on Ron's blog tucked away in his archive. If you search Ron's blog, it pops up all sorts of stuff that he's probably forgotten from years ago. Um, Lots of stuff I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> so there were a couple of definitions online. Uh, there was a, a, a brew Wikipedia one and a few other things. And I thought, well, this description looked to me a reasonable sort of description. So what I did, I contacted um, Holland Malt and their QA manager uh, came back to me. And what I sent to him was that description. I said, if you were presented with that description, what, what would you say? And what he said was that, they produce their crystal malts in quite a similar way where the temperature increases and the uh, starch is mostly broken down. Uh, it's not actually kilned. It's done as part of the process, say in one of the, the, the salad in boxes or something like that, depending how you do the process, uh, uh, how much heat, etc., cetera, uh, will determine how crystallized the malt is. The other key thing he said was that the enzymes would be denatured. So it's very much one of those um, types of malt from that description was that you would steep it to actually get its goodness out. So it's some form of caramel or crystal malt. What would you use for a modern equivalent? Well, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, and I went for the Brees article, which was uh, titled, is it, is it crystal or caramel malt? And it would seem that there is a different, if, if I've understood it correctly, and I'm happy to be, by somebody that knows a lot more about this, I'm happy to stand correction. Just put it in the comments below. 
if I've understood it correctly, crystal malt is generally made by roasting. And caramel malt may be roasted or kilned. And that kilning may lead to a mix of mealy kernels and would have a flavor, a flavor mix between some sweetness and grainy malty. So there's likely to be different flavors. Now, based on the previous slide, I think we're looking for malty caramel with around that, that 30, um, 30 EBC. So what I came to is that something for the recreation equivalent to Cara Red, which is the Vireman uh, product, or possibly Cara Amber. And when we have a look at some recreation recipes later on, we can see a little bit of different interpretation between Ron and myself. I put some other ones there that might be in the ballpark, all focus around that 30 EBC and looking for that, that, that caramelly uh, flavor. So you might ask if you've got the broy malt, broy malt, why have we got caramel malt there? Good question, glad you asked. I'm not sure, it seems strange to me. And the amount of caramel malt that we saw on the earlier slide was in the, what, the 3% range. So it, it, it must have been something that packed a punch. Otherwise, why would you put it in there? If, if the broy malt is the caramel malt by its percentage, the idea that I had, and again, I'm, if somebody actually knows for sure with some documented evidence, I'd love to hear it, is that I think that this is a, a form of melanoid malt where you put a small amount in and you're looking for a big flavor impact from that small quantity. That's my, uh, my take on it. So when we, when we look at modern materials that we could use, well, Pilsner malt is Pilsner malt. There was something in the, uh, in the records where they had M with the U with the omelette. Uh, and I've assumed that's the Munich malt. Uh, rice meal, well, rice flakes is probably the go there rather than um, trying to convert um, uh, broken rice or something. We've got the color malt. So Carafa Special is probably uh, a good choice there. Uh, the broy malt, as we've discussed, perhaps cara red, and then some melanoidin for the caramel. And then a lot of the beers ended up having caramel coloring. Now, Parisian essence, uh, gravy browning, but without all the exotic herbs and spices is probably all right. Or, or cinema, something that will just give you a, a different tint. So there, that's the framework that we've come to on, um, uh, on the different malts. And with that, I'll let Ron talk about this one. So yeah, I had to do the malt one. You can do the mashing scheme. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the great things about the, the, the records is that they have, the, the pilot brewery records is, they have very detailed records of what was going on during the mashing process. And I was surprised to see that they were doing a fairly traditional decoction. Um, so for the Pilsner, it's a double decoction, but a bit more complicated than that because you've also got a step with the rice. And I had a lot of discussion on my blog when I, when I published this about, about the rice phase and people saying, well, the temperature is way too low. And then eventually someone else came in and said, well, no, not necessarily. Um, what I, it's, this doesn't mention is that the, with the, mass, the, the the rice step, that they mix the rice flour, it seems to be, uh, with the water, with water, and then they took some of the mash and, and put that in. So I'm guessing that's really important because that's where the enzymes are going to come from. But it's a very brief step. So it's only a, 
literally like five minutes that it's in there and then it's added back to the whole mash and then there's the first decoction done where it's first raged to 70 degrees and then boiled and then added back and it's classic decoction so you're taking off some of the mash boiling it adding it back to the remainder and that bumps up the temperature so you're getting a, a step mash through doing that but you've also got the boiling and so there's there's two two decoctions uh, a couple of rests one at 66 and then another one uh, then you're mashing out at 75 um yeah it's fairly classic uh, double decoction and at 415 minutes in total quite a lengthy process so they were doing a lot of messing around it's there's a lot much simpler ways to to mash than this and i noticed that when you look looking later in the pilot brewery records you can see them playing around with different mashing schemes and one of the things they're doing is they're doing a, a single decoction mash and also playing around with stuff that looks more like a hog kurtz which is a fairly typical german uh, mashing scheme for a pilsner one where you not doing very much in the way of boiling because you don't want to boil for too long because you don't want to darken the color through the boil and so that's typical of later German ones but at this point they're still doing yeah pretty classic uh, decoction methods this is a nice little diagram showing uh, uh, the, the, the what's going on with the, the decoctions and with the main mashes and it's a very nice di diagram which uh, Peter put together and it, and it just shows you an, an overview of what was going on in the mashing scheme. Now here we've got the, the Munchner, and this is more complicated because this is a triple decoction. So here you've got, uh, you start off at, at 55 degrees, then you've got a rest at, sorry, at 50 degrees, then you've got a, a rest at 55 degrees, then another rest at 67 degrees, and in between them you've got decoctions. And then there's the, then you mash out at 74 and a half, sparge, and that's it. And this takes slightly longer at 420 minutes. And yeah, th this was one of the things that really surprised me that, that as late as this, Heineken were going to so much trouble, as, especially what you also have to realize is by this, even though it had been the first bottom fermented beer they brewed was a, with what they call Bayesch, which is, means Bavarian, so it means a Munich style beer. Uh, so that was the original lager that they made. By the 1930s, it wasn't all that popular anymore, and it was a fairly small part of their output. So you're looking at maybe five or six percent of what they brewed was the Munchner. So it's odd that they're going to this much trouble for something that was a fairly low volume beer. But then again, I, I guess it was probably the most expensive beer as well. So maybe they thought it was worth it because of that. And here we're looking at the hops. Um, I've looked at a lot more Heineken records. Uh, the, the ones from the main brewery can be fairly frustrating because quite often they only seem to be mentioning the hop merchant and not the actual type of hops. They, in, in this case, they all seem to be uh, Czech hops. They did use a lot of Czech hops. Sometimes you see them specifically called SARS. Also this uh, Litomia Mieritsa, um, which is somewhere in the Sudetenland, and which also seems to have been well known for producing good quality hops. You also see an awful lot of Halatau in, in the main, main brewery records. That seems to have been their preferred hop. I've also found some references in slightly earlier ones to where they were using English hops, but they seem to have given up on that by the by the mid to late thirties. And it all seems to come from central Europe. That seems to be their sole supply of hops. And that continued right through World War, World War II. I mean, interestingly, they were still getting supplies of new supplies of German hops in 1941 and 1942, which is quite surprising, seeing as Germany was getting starting to be fairly messed up by then. And this is the brew house. Um, if you remember the two nice bay windows that you saw in the overhead view of the aerial view of the brewery, there are the things at the end here. And it, it, it looks very much like all these uh, classic breweries, classic lager breweries do. Um, I've seen- it's, it's just, a, it's a real shame 
that it wasn't in colour because that would have been gloriously polished copper, I would expect. I would think so, yes. Um, so I've seen loads of brew, brew houses in Central Europe that look like this. Uh, the Pilsner Hotel brew house looks like this. Um, really, and you can see the lovely glass windows and everything. It's a, a, a very beautiful building. Uh, another great thing, one of the most frustrating things about brewing records is they virtually never list the hop additions. I've got so little information on this. I've got a handful of, of, of English breweries where there's some mention of the hop additions, but in general, it's very poorly documented. And so I was really pleased to find out the, find the real hop additions for the Heineken beers. And it was completely not what I expected. Um, the, the length of the boil, I was surprised that there was a 120 minute boil. I would have thought it would have been shorter. But the biggest shock was the way that the hop additions worked so that they got larger as it went through. Whereas normally you'd send to have, if, if the hop addition, additions aren't of equal, equal quantities, you tend to have more at the start rather than at the end of the boil. Excuse me. This must have had an effect on the finished beers because the hopping rate's fairly low, but a lot of the additions come very late. So just 20 minutes before the end. So even though the bitterness must, would, would have been quite low, there must have been quite a lot of hop flavor uh, in, in the finished beers. So that's quite interesting to know that they're not going for bitterness, but going for hop flavor, which in a way is incredibly modern. <laughs> if you think about the way people hop nowadays with, uh, with IPAs. And you can see it's, it's something similar with the, with, with the Munchner, that most of the hops are at the start of the boil, at, at, at the end of the boil. So half of them are in the 20 minute edition. And you've only got, you know, less than a quarter at the, at the start of the boil. And again, the Bock, pretty similar. So it's, it's very much the same for, for all their beers that you have this increasing quantity of hops as the, as the boil progresses. We're doing the cooler, the cooling was exactly the same as, as UK breweries did at the time. Because UK breweries, they'd start off in, in the open coolers and then they uh, use refrigerators to get to get the temperature down to the to the pitching temperature. And why did people carry on using these open coolers when, I, when I, they think I, I think I know. I think I know. Yeah. When, when it already it, you would think it would be a, a source of infection, but that that great surface area would have cooled, but also dropped out a lot of the lot of the troop and and led to a, a, a cleaner vert um, going into the um, into the fermenters. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's um, it's a technique that probably kept going until the paraflow chillers came in. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very late when, when British breweries got rid of their open coolers. I mean, you're really looking well after World War II for most of them. And it's for that very reason, as you said, it's because of the troop. It, it, you get a much cleaner wart by using a cooler because the stuff will drop out very quickly because it's very shallow. I think uh, Hook Norton, uh, I went there in 2004. Uh, they weren't using it as a cool ship uh, uh, they were using it like a, uh, a buffer for their process. Uh, but that's a really good example of seeing, uh, seeing a, a cool ship as it was. Or, or coolers. They just called them coolers, didn't they? they didn't yeah, no, it's coolers, the, 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 English, the, the standard English word for it. Mm. Um, where was it? I was at the other day. Oh, God, what's the name of the brewery? One of the small English ones. But they'd, they'd still got them, and they, they still got them in working order. But they weren't using it for the standard beers anymore. They were using it for some sour beers that they were doing. But they generally got genuinely got an operational uh, cooler. Hmm. And this is just showing you how the cooling went. So you can see the 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 image on the right. This is the this is the uh, the the cooler where the, you've got these copper pipes, and that would have. Um, cooled brine running through it and then the wort runs over the top and gets cooled and I, so you, I really I really like that photograph because it's so graphic on just how cold that system was with all the yeah. with all the icicles 
yeah, it's really good having all these photographs. But, um, this is some of the best combination of documentation I've ever come across. Having the photographs of the breweries as well as the explanations of the process. It's um, really wonderful to have. And so you can see that, yeah, it's about an hour in each of the machines. And, and after the, at the end of it, it's dropped it down to 41 degrees centigrade, which is the, the pitching temperature. Um, right. Now I have a question for you on this one. I mean, they, they've got open fermentation vessels, which again, is a bit old school. Uh, but my question is, what was the yeast they were using? Yeah, this, see, this is, this is uh, a good one. I, I was trying to find out where the Heineken yeast came from originally. And I couldn't find anywhere where they explained it really. Um, because usually where most of the early lager breweries got it from was, um, was ultimately uh, Spaten. So that's where Carlsberg got their yeast from. It's where people like Dreyer got his yeast from. But from what I, I can tell that the Heineken yeast is not the same. It's a different type of bottom fermenting yeast. So I'm not sure where they got it from. Um, but you, it's a beautiful photograph. This so you can see them skimming at the top of it, um, and that also seems to be quite primitive because it looks like the guy's just got a plank. Yeah. Whereas in a in a British brewery, they would have a parachute for taking up taking the stuff off, or a, or some, a mechanical device that would go across the top. So that's the you know just with a shovel and a and a plank of wood seems quite primitive. Well, also well, I've, I've seen pictures of the uh, of the Tooth's uh, uh, brew house and their fermentation, and they were using like uh, wooden barge boards uh, for for yeast skimming. So so All perhaps right. we, we're in the 1930s. So you know, perhaps that was about the state of play. Yeah, well, well, I think in, in, a, in a in a British brewery of that size, it would have been more sophisticated. I think. Uh, and, and obviously the whole the whole room is go is going to be cooled. Um, I mean, just looking here, it looks to me like there's a temperators in there as well. Yeah, because where, where it, those two two tubes are going? Yeah, those ones. Yeah, yeah that that definitely looks like a temperators to me. So um, a temperators being uh, metal pipes inside the fermenting vessel that you run cold liquid through to keep the temperature of the fer fermentation down. If you, and if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you can just three, see through the top of the beer, the pipework, bottom right hand yeah. corner. Yeah. I, it, um, wonderful resolution photographs from the Heineken Foundation. They, I was so pleased they, uh, they gave us permission to use them. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when we saw earlier with the fermentation profiles, where there's a, 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 oh, oh, no, we haven't got to that yet. Sorry. No, it's coming uh, up we, next. We, we, you, you, you'll see what the temperatures were used for when we get to the fermentation profile. And here, there, this is obviously them uh, storing the yeast that they've skimmed off. Um, again, just in these open buckets, which is quite interesting. It seems quite primitive. And um, even though they had a yeast propagation plant, which we will see in a minute, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a bit strange. So even though they, they, they were pr propagating loads and loads of yeast, you do see from the brewing records that it says where which brew the yeast came from, which is fairly standard in brewing records. And it's obvious that mostly they were repitching stuff that they'd harvested and that they weren't using fresh yeast every time, that they were repitching for a certain number of generations. But they I had, also find it also find had, it interesting. Sorry. Sorry, they, but they had two different strains of yeast. There's the yes, you've got the, the A, A and the D, and the D. And the, yeah. yeah. So the A, A strain is the one they used for the fancier beers, basically, and the D strain for the cheaper beers. I don't know why they had to. I don't know why they. I, I haven't seen explained why the D yeast was preferred for the cheaper beers. It doesn't seem to make much sense for me. But um, yeah, I mean, I also like in this photo that you can see. <laughs> that, that's obviously not part of the brewery that that roof next door that that's one of the houses from the next block so this must be right on the edge of the brewery th this room uh, 
And here we've got a look at the primary fermentation. They also had full fermentation records, obviously the pilot brewery uh, records, which is also quite handy. So you can see what happens. And yeah, it's, it's pitched pretty cool. Um, and then gradually rises during the fermentation. And then at the end, you can see that it drops to down again. So, I mean, this is, a, this is probably when it starts dropping from nine degrees, that'll be when they switched on the attemperators and deliberately cooled the wort, um, obviously getting it ready to be put into the lagering vessels. Um, this is the export Pilsner and, and it's something similar. So a, a total fermentation time of around 10 days, letting it rise during the initial phases and then crashing it at the end. And here's a nice diagram of the of the of the export pilsner, just so you can see what hap was happening. And it's pretty obvious when they started deliberately reducing the temperature of the wort. Um, yeah, and and in terms, of, I mean, it's interesting that this isn't very much different from what you'd see in English breweries, uh, other than the fact that the temperatures, whereas a normal English fermentation would be probably six or seven days, so a little bit warmer and a little bit quicker. And here's the Munchener one, a again, very much, very similar to the other ones. So slowly rising, then crashing back at the end. And here's a nice diagram of that. So I'm glad you put these together. I, 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 yeah, I mostly can't be bothered to do graphs from, uh, I, from I, things I, in Excel. I, I, I like the pictorial because that what that says to me it's got that lovely S curve for the attenuation. You can see how under attenuated it is compared to the to the Pilsner, um, and with the durations, I I think it just encapsulates. Um, if you were trying to recreate this beer, you'd be probably wanting to look at something like that so that you could compare how you were doing it. So yeah, yeah, no, very nice. And here's the Bock. Again, very much the same, but as with the Munchener, a fairly low degree of attenuation at the end of primary fermentation. So in this case, only 53%. And, they, and here you can see it's quite different that there's that the temperature profile, um, it's dropped halfway through and then plateaus and then dropped down again. I'm, I'm not quite sure why it has such a different profile for the for the bock. I, I, I'm I, assume... I, I guess we've got to be a little bit circumspect because the, the word pilot brewery may have meant that they were trying things out in some cases. Um, but... Uh, but, but, but when you see the Bock, I don't think these were trial brews because it says, in some cases, it says that they went to the main lagering tanks. Oh. Um, so I think that, it, and, and with the stout, the same thing's true post Second World War that it looks like it's they're just using it to brew small batches because it's a, a low volume beer. And with the Bock, I'm, I'm suspicious that some of them, the ones in the pilot brewery were actually production brews and not trial brews. And, and because some of it doesn't say, normally it says what they were trying out in that trial brew, which is useful. So then you know the thing that might be different from the standard process. And they didn't say that. What they say is that it's, I don't know, something about went to the main main lagering vessels or something like that at the end of primary. So it was, I, I, I suspect these were actually, at, at least some of them were actual beers that were going to be sold. Very good. And there was obviously a fair amount of fermentation going on in the lagering vessels. Uh, as you can see, the difference between the racking gravities and the terminal gravity. So, I mean, again, it's a good thing about the, these pilot brewery records is that it gives you the real FG. So it gives you the, the, the very final gravity of the beer and it doesn't just show the racking gravity. This is often frustrating with British records because they'll show the racking gravity. Uh, and then in a lot of cases, there was a fair bit of fermentation going on uh, either in a, in a vat or in a cask after that. And so you're not seeing the true FG. Whereas in this case, you know, this is the actual proper FG. And in, in every case, there's a good bit of fermentation going on in the 
in the lagering vessel, which is what you would expect if you're lagering the, in the traditional way, which is what we'll see next. And here you can see that, that not all of them give details of the lagering. There's a few that do. I would have liked that it'd be more detailed, really, but some of them it gives you enough to, to really see what was going on. So they're filling them up, leaving them open for a while, um, sealed. This is, I guess, when they're, they're spunded, so when they bunged it shut, pressurized, I, I guess that's when the pressure's starting to build up internally in the, in the lagering vessel due to the fermentation that's still going on. Um, you can see that there's a, a bit difference with the, the Pilsner and the export pills. They seem to have been going for around two months for the Pilsner, from what I can see. It varies a little bit um, between the different batches, but about two months. Whereas the Munchener, they seem to be going for four months. Uh, uh, again, as Peter said earlier, I have to be a bit careful about this because this might not be typical. And I think I've only got one example of the Munchener where they gave the full details of the lagering process. So this might have been an exception. Um, yeah, but it does look like they were they were lagering it for longer than the Pilsner. I mean, I mean, it's 70 odd days. I think that's not bad for a, for a large commercial beer. I think that's a fairly reasonable lagering time. And from looking at the stuff about the when it's being sealed and pressurized, it looks like it was being naturally carbonated as well, because this is the, the process you'd use if you wanted to carbonate it naturally. Um, I know that from the wonderful harp details that I have, where harp of all things used to be naturally conditioned, which is really weird. Ah, now the, my favorite slide, this one, because I trawled through the um, uh, the online photo archive, and I'll put a link to the um, uh, uh, the Heineken Foundation site, so you can look at uh, the wonderful wonderful things that are in there. But I particularly like this portable dispense machine, with what was um, perhaps a bit radical for the time, actually uh, serving with CO two. The Mr. Middleton had uh, identified that they were serving with air in the hotels rather than rather than CO2, um, but we're still thinking about it. And then my eyes were attracted to these tokens. Now these are beer tokens for the beer slot machine. Now. Because Mr. Middleton did a tour of the whole of Europe, he also looked at other things while he was there. He'd been to Germany, and the uh, my pronunciation of this will be terrible, but the Vulcan Olshank Automat is a picture of a beer dispensing machine that you put your tokens in. And a token was worth uh, 500 mils, so half a litre. So I just thought this was lovely that that your um, your workman of the day could um, go over to the slot machine and and have his pint. Of course, none of that would be acceptable today. Anyway, so I you know, Fuller's full full used to have a machine like this as well. If you go into the the um, Fuller's Hock Cellar, they've got a, a, a similar machine for dispensing beer. I'm not sure what period it's from, but probably a, a similar time. I just think it's a lovely idea. I, the comment was it might be a, a novelty item in a hotel. Uh, you could just imagine, you know, people playing the pokies, but actually <laughs> drinking beers. So we we come on now to some uh, recreation recipes. So we've, I've put these together in, in two different styles and I'll, I'll just give a prelude to this. Ron has done, his using Beersmith, and I've done my versions using Brewfather, and those um, uh, software packages calculate things a bit differently. To, to be able to cover all bases, I originally was going to do everything in metric, but Ron went, no, 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 you can't do that, can't do that. You've got to have US measurements. So the recipes labeled Ron are in 
US, not Imperial, US. And the ones labeled paint are metric with proper units. Anyway, Ron, do you want to talk about the pills now? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a fairly, fairly simple recipe, mostly just base pills and malts with some, uh, with a bit of rice thrown in. Uh, yeah, there's not much to it really. And, and SARS hops, a very simple light beer. I mean, I would guess this probably produces a fairly pleasant beer. Um, I've had versions of, um, one of the breweries here did a, did the Licht Lager beer, so the three and a half percent beer. And that was surprisingly nice, actually. It was really nice, light lager. You know, not nothing, no weird, strong flavors or anything, but a perfectly nice drinking beer and very refreshing. And I assume that this would come out something similar, that it's not going to have a huge amount of bitterness, but it's going to be a nice, light, easy drinking beer, sort of nice thing for a summer's day. Um, and probably much better than the modern beer, to be honest. Um, no, I shouldn't say that. Well, the modern ones. Um, of course you malt. can. Of course you can say that. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 Heineken Pils isn't the. It's it's definitely not the worst pilsner in Holland. Let's put it that way. I I, I think I think. Uh, no, let's not go there. Um, now, one of the now this is the metric recipe. Uh, and I've used pellets since, instead of using uh, whole cones. Uh, and my take on this, and I've used Australian ingredients, you can buy brown rice flakes in the supermarket uh, and using a, a local craft maltster called Voyager uh, with their pale schooner um, malt. Uh, I think that late hopping um, at 30 and 10 minutes, as Ron mentioned earlier, I think this would be quite a, a decent, uh, flavoursome light beer. You know, it's still it's still five percent, so it's uh, it, it I it would be good that if, I've not brewed this, but uh, it might be on the list at some stage to uh, give it a go. Um, but there, the the thing to, the thing for me is I I can't really understand why they labeled it export pilsner whereas the the pills and the export pilsner are damn near identical yeah i i i, I wondered about this as well it's the same post-war but there was an export well a post-war there's two export versions there's the uk one which is only three percent and there's one which i think was specifically for the us and the US one has a slightly different recipe from the domestic version, but really very minimal differences. And you sort of wonder why, but the pre-war one, even more so. Um, it might just have been what they were going to do with it later, because I've also noticed that there's a lot of stuff about the stuff about pasteurized beer. So it might be that the difference with the export version was they were going to pasteurize it. So it had a better shelf life. And they might have brewed it the same and then just had a slightly different process later on. But mm -hmm. why you'd label them differently in the brew house, I don't really know. No, I could sort of understand if they would brewed it at a, at a different strength or at a different hopping rate. But uh, anyway, one of those little mysteries that um, will move Well, I think some of, the, some of the ones I found, the, the hopping rate's slightly different. Some of the ones from the main brewery from a little later, so from like 1939. Uh, but I mean, it's a very minimal difference. It's, you know, like 5% more or something like that. And about that you think, well, it's, it's not really going to make any difference. Mm. So this is... I, actually say I call it bias. It's a bit, it's confusingly, they had two names for it. If you look at the older labels from the late 19th century, they call the beer bias on the labels. By this point, they were calling it Munchen on the labels, but they're still calling it bias in the brew house. So... Well, well, that, that's the Dutch word for Bavaria. Bavarian, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, now in your recreation recipe, uh, you chose uh, a cara amber. And, yeah. And in my version, uh, I went with the, um, uh, with, with a straight uh, cara malt with the, um, uh, the schooner malt, which is the, um, uh, melanoidin type malt uh, 
So yeah, a little bit of difference there. Um, I reckon that will be quite a, a nice drink in beer, that one. In fact, I think they all are. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of versions of, of some old Heineken beers. Um, was it one from, uh, I've had a version of this beer, the, the brewery just around the corner from me, brewed the 1911 recipe for the for the Munchener. And that was really nice, actually. It's a uh, very nice beer. Um, and of course the Bock. And um, Bock, Bock uh, they, they, they seem to have just taken the straight German set of inverted commas standard lagers and recreated them. Yeah, pr pr pretty much. Uh, I mean, if you go back to, to the 19th century, they, Heineken also brewed some other styles. So I've seen labels for Vienna Lager, uh, also a, a, a label for Erlanger. So that's another type of, that's a, that's a Franconian style dark lager. So I'd assume it would have been darker and, and more bitter than a, than a Munich mm. style. Um, so they played around with quite a few. Though the, the, the light and dark lager beers, they don't really fit in with any German style of the of the interwar period. Um, a German lager beer would have been stronger. That would have been probably at least four and a half percent. So they're a bit different. But things like the Bach and the Munich and the Munchner and the Pilsner, yeah, are very much like the German versions. Mm. So that that neatly brings us on to. Um the sequel so when we when we started this uh, collaboration uh, exercise we only really had 1935 and then with over the the last few months with more requests into the amsterdam archive uh we've now got nearly all of them up until 1957. now that has revealed quite a few interesting beers Ron's mentioned several little snippets, just as teasers as we've gone along. So we're of a mind to do another one of these and deal with the post-World War II Heineken Pilot Brewery beers. And there's some interesting ones in there. Now, we won't give it all away because that's just the way it is. So whether you like it or not, expect a sequel. So with, with great thanks to Ron for his um, uh, insight into the Dutch um, uh, brewing uh, history of Heineken. If you like what we've been talking about here, um, there's more excruciating detail in our books. Uh, Ron's latest book is AK. Uh, and my latest book is Galbrews. Uh, the links will be down below in the... Um, uh, in the comments. If you like what we've done, please hit the like button. I would like just to acknowledge once again uh, the Heineken uh, archives and those wonderful people that have been digitizing all these uh, records at the Amsterdam uh, archives who are unknown to us, but they've, they've really, it, it's been absolutely uh, a wonderful experience, even from somebody so far away in Australia, because all the details of a beer are in the Pilot Brewery records. Not some of them, the whole beer is described, and that's absolutely golden. The Heineken Collection Foundation were most uh, helpful in, in giving us permission to use the, um, uh, the photographs and, of course, the Noel Butlin archive. So as I said, the links are below and we'll see you with the sequel in due course. Say goodbye, Ron. Bye.